You need a radio announcer voice. Hi, and welcome to a new episode of Lost in Grinterion. I'll be your host, Adam Glass, and this is my co-host, John Patrick Dorgan. Sorry, that was all. Go ahead. Thank you for doing the introduction this week, Pat. And uh, no problem. <laughs> that was great. I don't know why I called myself Adam Glass, then. Well, I mean, well, I'm going to stick with that. Today, we're uh, talking about Beauty and the Beast, 1946 edition, live action, uh, from the uh, French poet Jean Cat. Cockatoo. Cockatrice. Speak French, we've established that. It's not cockatoo, that's too many syllables. Well, I said cockatrice. Uh, cockatrice. <laughs> All right. Cockaforce. Right. <laughs> there we go. Keep I think we've got it. Right on the nail. <laughs> no. uh, so, uh, it is an adaptation of the French fairy tale, obviously. Uh, a very early one, a very influential I mean, one. This is a French fairy um, tale? Again, yeah. not a Disney Beauty movie, apparently. Beast. Yes, Beauty and the Beast. I French assume they invented Bell, it. Not a Disney movie. Which is very not confusing. Not a Disney movie. I hope you, uh, I hope you watch the right one. I <laughs> hope so, too. The animation was fantastic in this one, though. Yeah, beautiful. I think they might have used computers. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, so let's get down to breast tacks. Let's get into this. Um, so there's not a lot of background information. It was 1946, obviously, so French coming out of World War II. Um, but at the same time, I don't know if that really, you know, I've, I've talked to, I've talked in the past about how when it was made really affects period pieces. Um, this is not a period piece. Well, I mean, it's a period piece, but not for the period that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, it's, it's a period piece in that it's a fairy tale. So it's right. this general French fantasies. Right. It's, the, it's uh, that time. Middle that ages exist. type of thing. Yeah. It's that time that all fairy tales take place. Right. <laughs> It starts off, I, I really, I do like the first image of, because, uh, you know, being a, being a fairy tale, there's just sort of childish, childishness to it, and uh, Katal kind of breaks the fourth wall to specifically say that, and we'll get to that in a second, but before he even gets to that, there's this great thing, uh, great establishment of the childishness of it is that the opening credits are all written on a chalkboard, and, and the first few are... poorly written on a chalkboard, nonetheless. The first few are physically written. Yeah, and then... Uh, and then eventually it's just this italicized text superimposed on the chalkboard, um, which I think, I, I really wish they had kept writing them. I think it would have been I great. I think probably they uh, especially as Yeah, especially as they slowed down. Because <laughs> uh, it gets tiring, uh, writing and erasing and writing. Uh, anyway, uh, so it starts off with this sort of introduction. Um, and I'm sure this affected both me and Pat, so we'll get into this. Yeah. Uh, children, he quotes, um, Children believe what we tell them. They have complete faith in us. They believe that a rose plucked from a garden can plunge a family into conflict. They believe that the hands of a human beast will smoke when he slays a victim, and that this will cause him shame when a young maiden takes up residence in his home. They believe a thousand other simple things. I ask you as a little of this childlike sympathy, and, to bring us luck, let me speak four truly magic words. Childhood's Open Sesame, Once Upon a Time. It's establishing this childlike atmosphere, and I think you had some problems with that. Well, you know, just like always, the first thing we got to do is, you know, what are your general impressions of the yeah, film? Yeah. And mine are con- connected directly to this opening. Uh, in my mind, it was kind of set a mood for the film that said, look, you're not going to believe this. So, can you try? But, like, this is film land, right? Like, we're supposed to be watching a fairy tale. Like, you know, fairy tales are no less potent for adults just because we don't believe they're real. Yeah. But he feels a need to inform us. Look, okay, this isn't real, guys. Check this. (laughs) Everything you see here, fake. (laughs) So, can you just bear with me? Suspend your disbelief? It's like, you don't need to ask your audience to do that. And I think that sets a mood that says, look, we... 
don't think you're going to enjoy this. Yeah, yeah. I I understand where you're, you're not a kid. I understand where you're coming from, but at the same time, I know people who would react the way he scared people are going to react. He's asking us to watch it as children because he believes that there are people who will watch it as an adult and be turned off because of that. But and, do you think their minds are capable of switching gears just because some dude asked them at the beginning of a film? Probably I don't not. Think so. I think you make a valid point there, but at the same time, I do know a guy who uh, a couple of months ago, when the new uh, the new uh, Muppets movie came out. I walked into work. Afterward. Don't spoil it for me. I still haven't seen it. You need to see it. But I walked in. It hasn't come out in Japan. I walked in gushing about it, and it's the night watchman at at the hotel. And his first reaction was, "Oh, that's a kids' movie. I'm not going to see that." <laughs> Puppets are real. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, the Muppets. The Muppets even worse. I mean, obviously, this is a fairy tale, and it's a fairy tale with some adult elements, just because it's a love story. By its nature, it has adult elements. Um. But but just the Muppets have never really been just a kids thing. It's like Pixar movies; they're not kids oh, films. No, Muppets were not even necessarily geared towards children at all. Yeah, in the their in, in, in the beginning, certainly not. Um, but but even you know with the Pixar stuff, with the Muppets stuff, it's it's family stuff. It's not right. It's supposed to have a little bit for everybody. Yeah, writing this off as a kids movie, and and. And unfortunately, Jean Jean Cato, he kind of he he wants you to write it off as a kids' movie, right? That but that's the weird thing is by telling you this at the beginning, you're taking those people who are not going to do that, and at least in my case, making it worse. Yeah, because I'll sit through. A, I love fantasy. I love science fiction. I love fantasy. My favorite genres. But as soon as you tell me, oh, sorry, I just bumped my microphone. Uh, as soon as you tell me not to do that, my in, yeah. Like my inherent ca- contrary nature <laughs> says, well, no, it you, really must just be so a kid's the, film. The problem is you just hate authority. I'm I'm a jerk, but no, I mean I just feel like it sets this really awful mood at the beginning of the film. Like it's almost like he watched the film, and like it seems like it seems so modern a certain way that it got screened by test audiences and they all hated it. <laughs> And he's like, I better put this warning at the beginning, like because they don't, they don't understand. It's like, no, you're not going to excuse bad filmmaking by yeah. putting a warning at the beginning. Like the modern movies where they don't screen for critics just because they know it sucks. Right, exactly. Or like, oh, we better add these extra yeah. scenes to make it make idiots be able to tell what's going on. It's yeah. like, you know, I, I mean, here's the thing. We're, yeah, I was going to make jokes about the more jokes about the animated film. I actually like the animated version of Beauty and the Beast. Yeah, I'm an adult and I like it, and it's the same story. Yeah, but I did not like this one. And there's it, no reason why the same story told by two different people, I should dislike one version except for the fact that I don't feel that he did as good of a he didn't do a very good job, and he decided to excuse himself at the beginning by saying, "Look, this isn't real, dude." You know, just bear with me. Yeah. So. yeah Maybe I'm yeah. just a jerk. <laughs> Who hates love. You do hate love. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of hating love, I hated quite a few of the ways love was represented in this movie. Oh, um, I know. I have not. At the very beginning, uh, the brother's friend, the one who is in love with Belle... Uh, Gaston in in the Disney remake because and and I say one of the reasons I say influence uh, obviously this had a lot of visual influence on the Disney movie just the way right the, that was going to be one is. of my jokes at the um, that was going to be one of my jokes at the beginning was about how like I really like the musical number at the beginning of this yes. one I was like oh oops yeah Maybe that's uh, the wrong film <laughs> oh you um uh, apparently uh, and I've never read the original fairy tale. Uh, as no one there by. I, I'm sure no one has. Um, <laughs> but uh, there is no there is no second second man. There's uh, um there is no other guy. Um, I did not know that. So it was uh, the character of Avenant was created for this movie. Um and obviously the character of Gascon in the Disney film very very much it's based on Avenant, based on yeah. Avenant. Um, Which is a weird thing, because now that you say that, I kind of find myself thinking, that extra character is not really necessary. No, it's not. 
the story would be better, I think, without it. It's not. And, and you know, I'll get much more into it later uh, because it's one of my least favorite things about the film. But but the fact that Amanant exists and is the same actor as the guy who plays the Beast oh, gosh. goes, yeah, goes that, so far. We'll talk about... We should maybe... Uh, yeah, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but even at the very beginning, uh, Avanant's really rapey. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Avanant is a creepy... Creepy. He is dude. such a creep. Uh, it's, I mean, he, he, he jumps in and he talks about loving her while she's, you know, she's, all she's doing is scrubbing the floor. And she scrubbed the floor to such a ridiculous shine that you can see yourself you can in see it. Her, yeah. Dirty farmhouse floor. Um, well, you know, the, obviously they were richer than they are currently. Yeah, it's not uh, really a farmhouse. I mean, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a manor. Yeah, it's I a manor. I mean, it's, it's got a, a it's got a, it's got a foyer. Yes, it does. It does, and a very large dining room. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no. But he, he immediately jumps in, talks about he loves her, and you know he wants to marry her, and he wraps his arms around her, and she's clearly uncomfortable. At yeah, that. but this is not stopping Avon at all. But that is not stopping him. And finally, the brother, her brother, walks in and calls him a hoodlum and tells him to stop. Ben. And the weird thing is, okay, go, sorry, I'm sorry to keep interrupting, well, but I'm, like, no, it's certainly a weird that, thing that, there. You go it's ahead. Weird. Well, no, the, the weird thing is, is, at that point, because you don't know the characters at all, I was like, oh, her brother's a pretty swell guy. Yeah. And yeah. then, and then you find out no. They're best friends. Yeah. Avanon and, and, and the brother. Yeah. And and you know he immediately says something that suggests that he says he says well I'm the same way but I can't have you doing that to my sister. Um, right, right. But like at the same time, without the n- knowledge of what's going to happen, you're yeah. like, well, this is weird. I guess the, the brother's defending her honor yeah. or whatever. Yeah. In in my experience, that would establish Avenant as this antagonist. Um, and, and the brother as, as, you know, more on Belle's side, but that's not how it plays out for the rest of the movie. No. Um, the brother is very much Avenant's friend, and, and even in the, in the last moments, they, they act together. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, everybody, everybody but the dad is very against Belle being happy at the well, castle. Yeah, even I though, think you even, and I talked about this before yeah. we started recording. Not beyond that. Everybody but Dad is basically irredeemable. Yes. No. No. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's that's one thing. One reason to view this as a child would view a thing is that Bell's Bell's love life is very simplistic. Yeah, Bell's love life life is simplistic to the point of being nearly yeah terrifyingly I mean, animalistic. Obviously. All adaptations of Beauty and the Beast, the original story, have this very Stockholm Syndrome thing about it. Okay, good. <laughs> One of us was going to bring up Stockholm Syndrome. It's on <laughs> yes. my notes, too. I mean, that's, 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 that's how the fairy tale plays out. Beast, you know, gets, gets Belle's, Belle there, falls in love with her, and she slowly falls in love with him as she's trapped at the castle. And she is right, trapped right. at the castle. I mean, there's no denying Beast has kidnapped a woman... And sure, he gives her free reign over the castle, but she can't leave. Yeah, and she said, and... even when she does leave, it's only on the promise that she comes back. And he specifically says, if you don't come back, I'm going to die. It's a very emotionally abusive relationship. Well, it's... and then throw in the fact that, like, he, like, throw in the, the I'm going to come here this time every day and ask you to bury yeah. me. Like, that's so Stockholm Syndrome <laughs> inducing <laughs> behavior. Like, yes. Like, yes. I'm going to p- implant this idea of your love for me in your head every day until your brain can't cope with it and makes it reality. Yeah, yeah. And then in the last in the last few minutes, you know, that, that final scene, he's, you know, he knows about Avenant now, the beast. And he asks, he asks her about Avenant, and she says that she loved him. And that is not something I can see from the way they've interacted prior to that. No, it's totally... No, yeah, it's like, oh, yeah. you loved him, or like, I love. What about this man? You love? Did, did you love him? And it's like, yes, I did. And it's like, what? huh? No. <laughs> when did we find that out? Yeah, and then and, and then, then in yeah. the moments between him trying to rape you. Mm-hmm. Yes, and then the beast asks if uh, if she loves him, and she says yes. And at the same time, it's just this. Uh, 
Uh, they're they're both they're both just as believable answers. Yeah. Because nothing we've seen, you know, suggests that she would love uh, Avenant. Nothing we've seen suggests that she should love the Beast. Except, well, and and not that long before in her family's house, she's like, "Well, I'm fond of him." Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I guess he's okay. Yeah. Exactly. It's like, what? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think she's just a bad actor. Maybe she's a bad actor. She's got this real pouty thing all the time. It's, oh, it's I, very, oh God, it's I, very I hate French. her face. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very, like most yeah. of the time, she looks unhappy. Yeah. No matter even the moments where she's supposed to be like, "Oh, the Beast, he's so gentle." It's more like I feel like she might be like about to chew on a piece of leather. Yeah. She looks angry. Yeah. I really want her to be a stronger female character than she is. Yes. Especially as the protagonist. Um, well, yeah, and I feel like probably in the original fairy tale she had some strength as a character because otherwise the story wouldn't be interesting. I mean, her her entire motivation for going to the castle is to save her father. Because her father's going to die unless she goes and lays down her life for him. She goes expecting to take the death roll. Um, and that, you know, that's that's chivalrous of her. But it's not... <laughs> I don't know. It just, it doesn't work for me. I guess and it's I mean, it's a fairy tale, so it's simplistic. But maybe I'm just buying his warning too much. Um, uh, but yeah, um, she friend zones him. Pretty pretty straightforward. Uh, pretty pretty well off. Because um, every night at dinner he proposes, and she says, "Let's be friends. Why ruin our special relationship?" Yeah, she doesn't exactly say that, but um, it's close enough. But then when he's late for dinner, um, you know, and he's off stalking around, um, you know, and she begs to see her father, and he says, well, when you, I'll let you go, but when you come back, you have to be my wife. And she says, you're killing me. Just really funny. Yeah. So it's great. It's there's, like, a of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, like, eyeball deliveries. Like, yeah, right, exactly. And I think that's one of the things that makes it worse for me. Uh -huh. Which is why I said, like, I think that's a major reason why I didn't like the film, is, like, none of this was delivered with sincerity. Like, every character seems to just be like, yeah, like, sure, or something, you know what I mean? It's, I don't know, I feel like a lot of people phoned it in. Yeah, well, I think, I think at the same time, though, with Belle's delivery on some of that, it's meant as characterization in that she really doesn't believe what she's saying. And maybe that that's the only place we get... A strength for her is mm. that is that she doesn't necessarily really love Avenant, but she's just, eh, socially she yeah, should. Yeah, she, she well, and the weird thing is, is she basically in the kitchen kind of agrees that she should marry him. Yeah. If it weren't for the fact that she needs to take care of her father, but yeah, yeah. I guess you're right. Like you do kind of get a delivery from her that's so not. Um, her words are so n not. Uh, what on the word uh, uh, genuine? Yeah. And so yeah, yeah, but then again, like you get into the beast part, and to me, to my mind, because my understanding of the story, she is supposed to be slowly falling in love with this man. Yeah. And because of her sort of same non-genuine delivery, it's hard to believe that she is. Yeah, it's true. That's true. And and especially at the at the end, um, you know, and we find out uh, Avenant's come to 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 kill the beast, but then they decide to break into the, uh, the, the temple thing, the pavilion of, of Diana, and the statue of Diana shoots him with a magical arrow that turns him into the beast, and, uh, and as he turns into the beast, our, our main beast de-transforms back into his princely figure, and it's the same actor with a different haircut, um, yeah, which right. isn't, you know, isn't as bad as, as the way I said it, because it's supposed to be the same actor. And they comment on it, and he says, he asks, he asks Belle if she's disappointed that he looks the same. And she says, yes. And then you know, she pauses, she says, no. Um, you kind of get into the, uh, you have to wonder about that too, because that adds a sort of extra element of creepiness to the whole affair. That like, Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, Yeah, it does. I, I don't know how to describe my feelings about that, but it's uncomfortable yeah like she should be unhappy that it's the same person yeah exactly and i was and uh, which means 
which means the only real difference is characterization. You know, since they look identical, she's choosing based on who they are, not what they look like, and that's right. that's good. Except who they are was one guy. She said, however, unbelievably, she's in love with who is really, really rapey, and the other guy's really, really, really emotionally abusive. And he's got this, uh, he's animalistic, but now he's lost the animalism um, because he's not the beast anymore. And all he has to offer are, you know, riches beyond her dreams, obviously, a place for her father, he promises, which will get her, of course, because that's what she wants. Um, and then, uh, you know, it's just, it's money. She's, she's right, traded. right. Belle, who is supposed, I think, in here to be contrasted with her sisters, who are all yeah. about the all about the cash. Yeah. Turns out to be exactly the same as them. Yeah. And, and one of the Slightly different motivations for why she wants it. Yeah. One of the promises the beast makes also is that her sisters will be her handmaids. And so, right. Which is so, yeah. Again, like, wow, Belle, you're no better than your sisters. It's very. Yeah. Upsetting. It is as very a, as a As a moral, as an ending to a fairy tale, which I suppose are supposed to be kind of like morality plays. The moral of the story is, um, be a terrible person. It'll all work out in the end. I don't know. Yeah, apparently. Or we're all bad inside. (laughs) I don't know. It's like a very upsetting moral, and like to a fairy tale. I mean, and mind you, I guess fairy tales used to be much more. (laughs) Yeah, obviously everything. This isn't. But still, I always get the impression that even when they were nastier, they were supposed to have a positive message about, like, your behavior. Yeah. This one yeah. doesn't seem to teach you a positive message. Really, yeah, this this teaches you the message that, um, as a woman, your choices in who to marry mean nothing. Right, because they're all the same. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah you're just going to trade one kind of awfulness for the other. All that matters is that they can take care of your family and they're wealthy enough to take care of you, too. Yeah, it's weird. And then, again, like, we get into the fact that, like, adding this extra character really makes the movie worse. Yeah. I was not aware of the fact until you mentioned it, but now that I know, having, whatever his name is, Avenant, in there makes it a less positive story. Yeah. If it had just been, like, at the end, she's like, are you disappointed? Or, you know, if he had been like, you know, this is what I really look like. It seems much more positive, yeah. right? Like, I mean, she didn't have a compare. There's no con- like comparison and contrast. She just fell in love with the beast. Yeah. And um, and and there's it's highly explicit. I mean, uh, implicit that you know this is really she came back to him obviously, and she was in love with the beast. But now it doesn't matter to her that the beast isn't the beast anymore because he's rich and he looks like her friend. Uh, yeah, yeah, that doesn't make sense to me. That's no, it, that's not again, a good thing. In the end, we, the the morality in the of the play, of the story is so befuddled at this point that it doesn't mean anything anymore. I yeah. guess the idea is that when it was made, it was just the goal was to make something romantic. It didn't matter yeah. that there was no real message involved. Yeah. Which I guess, and, from a purely romantic standpoint, it's got all the elements of a soap opera, and people yeah. love those. I suppose, as a including escapism, the, the, it's the great. weird looks back over your shoulder, yes, and blurry dramatic turns. Yeah, I guess it's got everything. Yeah, um, it's it's interesting to me that apparently Greta Garbo's reaction upon seeing this movie uh, at the ending was to shout, "Give me back my beast." Um, which is really, really true. I, Belle falls in love with the beast as the beast is. This is my problem right. with, with the, the fairy tale, period. Um, she falls in love with the beast as the beast is. And this happens in all kinds of fairy tales. Shrek does this. I mean, right. Shrek twists it, at least. Shrek twists it, at least, in that her real form is, is the, is the, uh, the ogre. Yeah. Um, but uh, any any adaptation of the princess and the frog does this. You have to fall in love with the monster as the monster, and then as a reward for looking past his ugliness, he turns into something beautiful. Right, and then you get into the fact that, like, well, I mean, I suppose if you 
had a monster. I think the original idea is that the person inside the monster is not supposed to be fundamentally different from the the beast itself. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, in like, but the only way you could really portray that in these sort of stories would be to have the man that comes out of the beast be equally animalistic. Or in yeah. the case of the yeah. frog and the prince, like eating flies. Yeah. Um, well, that yeah, exactly. But not, like, not necessarily that, but obviously, yeah. obviously, the change of forms is a punishment for the man. Right. Okay, that's how it's happened. Uh, we don't know backstory here necessarily, but that's always how these things are established. The change of form is punishment of the man, so he has to grow. But but here, you know, with the with the frog prince, the change of form isn't a change of attitude. He's still the person, right? And that's what we want to see: is we don't yeah. want to see any change of attitude. Yeah, with but the like, beast. With the, yeah, with the beast, it is a change of attitude because he's also more animalistic. He's also you know he's he's killing deer left and right. He's he's hunting. Well, and at night. like we get into, I think, and this is a part of the problem with this film is just a lack of. We don't get enough characterization of the. Like I mean, it's possible that you could portray him as those being like uncontrollable urges that don't directly play into his personality. That he feels remorse over the fact that he even has to do it this way. Yeah. No, I think he hit something there because almost every time it happens, it's after she's rejected him. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's like an overflowing of his of his desire for her. He becomes even more animalistic, which is a right. really really sad view of love as well. I think. Um, yeah. Very and, humanistic view of love, but. Yeah, I just feel still. like they could have painted him as like, you know, if done correctly, like these urges that he gets are not related to his personality. Yeah. They are a function of what he has become. Like the same thing, like a bear must eat you know, meat or whatever kind of thing. Or a lion yeah, yeah. eats gazelle whether a lion wants to or not. It doesn't matter how powerful the brain is or whatever. And so I can kind of get into an idea there that, like, you know, you could get in the same sort of frog prince thing where, like, it doesn't matter what he looks like. But they do paint this thing where, like, it seems in this story that his form directly affects his personality. Yeah. And so yeah, now absolutely. that he's, his form is gone, he's suddenly just a dashing man. Yeah. And it's like, well, no, he should be equally animalistic, possibly with less tendency towards killing deer with his bare hands. Yeah. But he still he still needs that tenaciousness. Otherwise, he's a completely right. he's a completely different person. Right. And there's and no reason the for her to if, still be in love with at him. At the end, he's he a is a completely, completely different, different character. Yeah. Yeah. If he is a completely different character, there's no reason for her to still be in love with him. Right. Um, right. So yeah problems with the story but oh, that aside that aside let's try to get back step back find something good about this movie it was the invention Visually, of furries it's not the invention of herpes not herpes furries <laughs> furries people are okay. like yeah i mean come on uh, yeah I'm just no saying. no costuming you know that's it's that's actually a pretty good costume no, the costuming's great, and obviously, obviously, it's the visual, the visualization of the beast, uh, and that t- that was five hours a day of makeup, apparently. Uh, it which it is turns out quite well. It turns out great, and he's still very emotive under it. Yeah, um, which is impressive, considering yeah, I mean, the kind of technology we're talking about at that time. Yes, considering we're, even, we're a 1946 see, rubber mask. You can even see that he has emotions. Is impressive. Yeah, yeah. His eyes, his eyes tell a lot, and his eyes being visual is great. Or visible is great there, um, but it's very—it's a very emotive mask, and obviously the way he's shown uh, has a lot of influence on the way the boy and the beast is portrayed later. There's a very, very lion-esque thing about it, but not—not not in the cartoony way that the the lion from uh, <laughs> why did I just forget the Wizard of Oz? Um, right, it's right. Not, yeah. It's not as cartoony as that lion, and no, that lion's can, a lot more human too. It. Believe it or not, like, if the rest of the film were better, in my opinion, this one, this, he could have contributed a great deal to the film. It's just the fact that the rest of the film was kind of bad, in my opinion, that, like, his ability to emote and, like, I mean, that act, whoever's showing those feelings underneath that mask is doing quite an admirable job. And it's really great because I think he's a better actor when he's in the Beast Bank Up. What, is it the same actor? It's the same actor. I mean, because like no, I mean, we, we know that it's the same character yeah. at the end, but is it the same actor? It is consistently the same actor the entire well, and time. And then that's insane because his character is much better yeah. as the Beast. 
which just yeah. reinforces the Greta Garbo thing about give me back my beast. Yes, because he's somehow yes, better no. actor in makeup. He's well, it's possible he that also like the magnification of his eyebrows and stuff in the makeup Maybe. lends emotion to his face. Well, a lot of a lot of people are very good with the way they emote with their eyes. Patrick Warburton's like this too, and why and why in the Tick live action series they chose to uncover his face instead of using the Tick's traditional hmm. cow eye cover, um, just slits of white. Uh, but but this guy, yeah, there's a lot of emotion in his eyes, and he's really good about that. Yeah, um, it makes and his it's, character it, later disappointing. Yeah, and it doesn't come through. It doesn't come through when he's not in the makeup at all. Yeah, no matter who he's playing, when he's not in the makeup, it does not come through. Um, I really, I actually really loved uh, the disembodied arms of the. Gosh, that was creepy. Well, here's the confused because later on she says invisible arms. Not yeah. disembodied. Invisible. Or like invisible so are they servants. invisible? Are they invisible to her? Are we Maybe. seeing a thing that they can't see? I don't know. I, I'm I just think curious. what it, what is the original fairy tale? It's invisible servants, right. and I think that's what she says. She doesn't mention the arms. The father, obviously, when he sees the arms, he he's, he freaks out. Right. So um, like the fact that he freaks out. Right. But like, yeah. If you saw a candelabra just float. He'd yeah, freak out too. So it's really hard to tell. Yeah, can exactly. he see them? I think can I Bell think he them? can. I know he doesn't react until he sees the hand from the table, right? And he checks under the table to see if there's the rest of the body. That's so true. Obviously, That's true. Yeah, obviously, right. he I've sees that, that hand. But Bell does call them invisible servants, and it's possible that. You know, I, well, look at the way the Disney movie dealt with this. Instead of having invisible servants or disembodied hands, it was just anthropomorph... Uh, anthrom- uh, can't say that word. Anthropomorphized? Um, yes, uh, living uh, you know, relics. You know, it was, yeah. The candelabra is now a person. The clock talks. They all walk yeah. around. Yeah. Um, and that's actually a little bit, in my mind, an easier way to deal with this than what they did. I, but like, I think it's just as scary, though. Oh, it is. <laughs> but because it's Disney and it's drawn so yeah. cute in such a cute way, yeah. it's not terrifying to children. Yeah. But the hands, oh yeah. my god, they're terrifying. Well, oh, and yeah. then the yeah. faces that follow you around staring at you from yes. the cornices and stuff, it's like, oh my goodness. It's pretty yes. terrifying. I mean, and it's 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 the same idea is that it's a living castle, and that's the same thing Disney does, but they do it in in a more cartoony way and a less gut reaction frightening way because right. disembodied faces, disembodied hands and arms, those are always scary, dehumanizing things. Right, exactly. Like, I feel like there were other ways that they could have dealt with it. They could have like, well, I mean, like they deal with it with the doors. The doors just open themselves. Yes, and they talk. And so you kind of wonder, like, why couldn't they have done something similar like that with everything? There's enough... I mean, surely they had strings in 1946 yeah. that they could have made things, quote-unquote, float with. Yeah. And there is there is one point when the father's walking into the castle that the candelabra does float because the arm lets go of it and points him toward the table. Right. Um, but, like, you know, they just... They could have done an invisible... But at the same time, that's not as visually... Just flat-out invisible isn't as visually appealing. Right. Um, well, and the thing is, is I, it's not... The faces in the stonework is a little terrifying at, at the very first. But you can yeah. kinda, I can kind of buy into that as a living castle thing, right? Like, if we draw... Yeah. If we carve a face of a person, it has eyes and it looks. But just hands yeah. are just the most terrifying thing in the world. Like, <laughs> yes. I... Like, I realized at that moment, I was like, oh, there's no way I could ever stay in this castle. It's creepy beyond all belief. And, yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, I, I agree there. I agree there. I just feel like you there had to be a different way they could have done it. I don't know what it was, but there had to be a different way. Because, like, I don't get living castle out of that. I get house of just horrors. House of horrors. Creepy, creepy, creepy. Yeah, all I get out of it is, is like maybe the beast detaches people's arms and then screws them into the wall and uses them to cam- <laughs> as a candle holder. Like that's really what goes through my head, even though I know like what they're trying to get at. Yes, you disembodied end up thinking, body parts wow, always. This, this beast is way more cruel than I thought he was. They make me think of Vlad the Impaler, not yeah. of not of magic. Yeah, <laughs> and maybe like the reaction of 1946 audiences is different too. 
disembodied arms, but considering they just came out of a war, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's 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 good to mention the war because I think one way this does work, um, uh, one one of the essays that came with my Criterion Collection um, version of this uh, was mentioned that it's very clearly a product of the war it was coming out of, and I don't think that's necessarily true. Because there's nothing in this that suggests some sort of even visceral reaction to the war. Right. And made in 1946, we're, we're in France, like very we much, are, you know, yeah, Nazi occupied very France. Very into the war. Like, barely. Very done. into the war. And this is just, this is complete escapism. And, well, and, and we in were that. talking about the could be the escapism that makes it connected to the war. Yeah. But. Yeah, no. But at the same time. I don't know. It just doesn't. It doesn't seem influenced by anything. It's just a straight telling of this fairy tale, and as such, uh, it's not trying to say anything greater than that. Well, it's, and I go ahead. I understand why it's why it's you know a great movie. Why it, why it deserves to be part of this collection? I suppose I just don't. on the visuals and the influence. But as far as telling a story and saying something meaningful, I don't think it's there. And any message I can take from this just turns me off. I don't think there is one. But, well, I mean, <laughs> the thing you're talking about, escapism, and I, I guess what we really need to know, and we don't have the resources because the Internet is hard, um, was there an influx of pure escapist fairy tale type stories right after the war? Is this part of a trend? Or is this just... Because I think if it were part of a trend, it would be much easier to justify that statement. It's like pure escapism with no morals, no reference to the war, no reference to anything that's happening in real life is somehow became super popular at that time. Well, and like, is it uh, more me... common at this point than it was prior to the war? Because I feel like there had to have been movies by, about fairy tales prior to the war. I mean, if this is like the first movie re adaptation of a fairy tale, then yeah, I guess it is a pretty monumental effort, regardless of how bad it is. Well, obviously, that's not true, because, you know, Snow White came mm. out in 1937. Oh, yeah, okay, so that's what I'm saying. So it's like, well, then what's the point? Yeah. I yeah mean, exactly. Again, if there's um, a major influx at this time, if this set off an influx of, like, here, let's make movies that are just meanless dribble, that people will eat up because they want to escape from real life, then yeah, I guess maybe it's important in the sense yeah. that it kicked off a new wave of crap. I think, well, I think there was there was a bit of that, I would think, post-war. Um, let's see, 1946 is also when It's a Wonderful Life came out, and that's... That's true. That that has a message, but it, it's still an escapist sort it's of It's escapist, movie. but it also even makes some references to the fact that, but, like... Yeah his life is as it is because of the war. Yeah, exactly. No, that's that's certainly true. Um, I mean, this doesn't acknowledge that life is bad at all. In fact, it creates this universe where awful messages are positive. Yeah. Well, like, yeah. on that same topic, like, what I was thinking is, is that, I guess, though, you, we, you know, in the previous episode, we talked about the French New Wave. That is a response to something. By making yeah. things more yeah. gritty, obviously people felt that the films between the new wave, which happened about ten years later, and the end of the war were mindless dribble. Dribble? Yeah. Dribble. Um, dribble. So clearly, like people felt that this was a, a, a theme. So maybe this movie is best acknowledged as the kickoff of an uh, era of kind of just um, fluff. I don't, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe. But I don't think that's something that's really super noteworthy or a great thing. I don't, I don't know. No, no, that's not good. That's not good. Uh, except that it might establish a, a French film miss that then created the new wave. Right. Uh, you know, ten, ten years later. Um, but but it's certainly it's nothing, nothing worthwhile, really, um, as far as the story. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the visuals are it, good for the but era. But at the same time, the visuals are amazing. The special effects are great. Yeah, I mean, considering what we were working with at the time, yeah, I yeah. mean, they're pretty fantastic. But, I mean, like, yeah. basically, in all my notes, I've got this list of notes, 
that earned it one point, which says the special effects are kind of nifty. <laughs> kind of nifty. They're more than kind of nifty. Well, no, I, yeah, they are great, but I mean, when you... I guess it just depends on how you approach the movie. I guess if you're a 1946 audience and wowed by the special effects, you can ignore the fact that the story is crap. But yeah. if you look at the story, you go, oh, huh? Huh? Really? Like, yeah, it looked beautiful, but come on. Yeah. You want me to buy into this film just because it's beautiful? Oh, yeah. Like, no, there's lots of beautiful it, things that I don't want to you know, call great. So, I don't know. Yeah. No, it's it's interesting. I think another another thing the movie did well, um, I talked about with, I talked about this with 400 Blows too, um, and maybe, maybe that just makes it indicative of French cinema, period. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, there's, there's kind of a lack of dialogue. Um, there's, there's not, it's not overly wordy. Um, and at the same time, it's a, it's a fairy tale that we're all kind of familiar with, so the only real wordy parts are where it's different, well, where we're establishing... Yeah, well, we... Pr- know, pra- yeah, I mean, with a fairy tale, Bob you could practically just not have dialogue at all. It could yeah. be a silent movie. Yeah. But there's a, there's a lot of pantomime in it. Um, not a lot of... Not a whole heavy amount of dialogue. And I think, I think that works out well, because obviously there's a lot... It relies more on its visuals, and its visuals are stunning. Right, and its um, acting is mediocre. <laughs> and its acting is mediocre. Um, I, think, I think one effect that really struck me as great was whenever Bell uses the mirror. Um, now, obviously, a lot of the times they use the mirror, it's, it's what we talked about with The Lady Vanishes, uh, the old shots where, where they there's no glass the in the mirror, yeah, yeah. and we're just... Look at this viewing. The mirror is kind of set up as yeah, yeah, as a framing, as a framing around the camera. Um, But there is one scene when she's at home and she's lying in bed and looking at the mirror on her nightstand, and we've got this distant shot, not not far, but we're seeing all of her body and the nightstand and the mirror on the nightstand, and she's looking into it, and the superimposition of the beast in that mirror. I thought was really great for 1946. It yeah. wasn't something I was expecting them to do. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, we've kind of covered. It's a beautiful movie. The the costuming's great, uh, but the story, the story, we just come we have to come back to it. Yeah, that. I mean, basically, we're it. stuck in a loop now. I mean, yeah. basically, yeah. we're trying to find nice things to say about it. It's pretty, but very shallow. I, I mean, it's 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 a very I think their relationship is very sexual without being outright sexual, and I think that's done in a very chaste, good way. Uh, there's the scene where she has him drink from his hand, her hands, um, and obviously all of his all of his going out and killing is this sort of reaction to to being shot down again. So it's this overflow of energy, uh, but but at the same time, that's a problem because it equates sex with violence. Well, and then you get um, into that's the not fact, something we really want to do. But then you also get into the fact that like they have this sort of sexual relationship, but then again, like her actual emotive reactions to him don't indicate that she feels a sexual energy towards him. Otherwise, yeah. you know what I mean? Like you don't get no, the impression no, that think... she's attracted to him. She does make gestures like that with the hands and stuff like that but then you go right there back to thinking that she could care less about him yeah she That's rejects really him immediately confusing. because yeah yeah she's oh yeah obviously she's she's back and forth and maybe that's good um <laughs> That that she just doesn't. There's there's no clicking point. There's no there's not even a slow falling in love. She she goes back and forth a lot. Her her uh, her emotions are not um, they're not a consistent change. They're in flux, and that makes sense for the position she's in. I think because right. you know she's she's pulled out of her element. And she's only doing it because she loves her father so much and she doesn't want to see him die, but she's willing to lay down her life for him. And then she lands it and she's, you know, it's, it's, she's got everything she ever wanted. Well, she wants us to go back to visit her father and she goes back to visit her father and her 
sisters are just jealous of what she yeah, has. Got to love those sisters. Um, and decide that they need to steal her away from it and kill the beast so that they can steal all of his stuff. Yeah, um, yeah, and yeah, the peripheral characters are evil. It's true. Yeah, the per- and they are very one dimensional. They are. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely one dimensional. There, everybody's kind of flat, but that's at least we understand. At least, at least Bell's emotions are something more morally good than yeah. Reed. But it's like on a scale; it's like a sliding scale of Nazi. Well, yeah, <laughs> I mean, like the the sisters are awful, so everybody's better compared to the sisters. But yes, that doesn't yes. mean they're good. Again, yeah, like I said, no, the only no. character I liked in the film, including Bell, was the father. Was the dad? Because he's the, the only dad. one I thought. Oh. He has legitimate motivations for the things he does. He loves his daughter, but yeah. he even kind of encourages her to go to back. And it's like, do you love him? And it's like, yeah, and then you should go, kind of thing. And it's sort of like, I don't know. I like I said, like maybe I misread the emotions from Bell, but even with that sort of yeah. back and forth, sort of like, oh, I'm not sure. Which, is, as you said, a legitimate reaction to this situation. I didn't get a lot of back and forth from her. A lot of times I just felt that no matter what, in the end, she didn't like the Beast. And sort of, for Maybe. me, the way I was reading the emotions, we went from zero to, yes, now that you've changed into the man, let's fly off and get married. Like, yeah, she did things that indicated she was at least cared for him. Like the hand yeah. thing, and then also like her reactions to her returning instead of just staying away like the, her actions said that but I don't felt I didn't feel like her visual her facial emotions said the same thing as her physical actions do you think do you think then that her motivation never changed that the entire movie all she was thinking about was what's best for her father it's possible maybe this movie is way deeper than we've given the credit for yeah. perhaps she and, only you know, cares about taking care of her father and she takes whatever road necessary to do that. Yeah. And she's still afraid, she's still afraid that if she leaves, you know, the beast will kill him because he's, you know, he said it. And she doesn't want the beast to die, but at this, or she says she doesn't, but at the same time, you know, she's willing to stay. She feels guilty about him dying, and that's why she he, she comes back. But she's willing to stay over at her family's house um, you know, not just not just because her sisters convince her that they love her now, but because her being there has made her father better. Yeah. So, I but I wonder if we're not creating things that aren't there. Maybe, maybe it's possible. In the possible desire to make this movie good, we're. Cre- I mean, it's possible that. I mean, but then again, like you really imagine that like audiences were reading that deep into this film. Well, I mean, and at the same time, even if that is her motivation the entire time, it doesn't make it. It doesn't make it good. Better. It makes her. A it doesn't make better. it better for me. I mean, I mean, I, I don't know if it even does. It's still her defining her life from an outside source. That's true, but and I really want, I really want her to define her life for herself. What I mean is, is that it means the acting was better than I thought it was. Oh yes, I suppose. It means it, that it the means, emotion she was showing what, were accurate to what was supposed to be portrayed. Yeah, I just don't yeah. think that's true because, like, especially with that opening. Like setup, it creates yeah. this universe that this is a fairy tale. It is only yeah. a fairy tale. There's no deeper that e- world here. Yeah, that that uh, yeah. No, you're certainly right. If he's if he's trying to make us not think about it deeper by presenting it as a fairy tale uh, and reminding us that it's a fairy tale, then maybe you're right that I'm reading too well, much. Well, I think we it. might both <laughs> in a desperate search to m- yeah. have it mean more. We're doing this, but yeah. But then again, we're also modern audiences. Maybe the fact of the matter is, is we can't just look at it as a fairy tale because <laughs> we don't want it to just be. Yeah. Huh. I don't know. Who knows? I mean, it's possible that. <laughs> no, I'm just saying that, like, we. It's possible that we. That we haven't been reading deep enough into it, or at this point, we are reading so heavily deep into it, we've created meaning that doesn't exist. Yeah. We want we want something to be there when it's not there. No, no, you're right. You're right. I mean, there isn't a way for us to we know. <laughs> it's true. It's true. 
Well, uh, I got none of that. Yeah, and I can't believe we <laughs> so... talked this long about this movie. <laughs> yeah. I think we can uh, get we this much out of our way, Um, I am not looking forward oh, to Armageddon. Oh, man. And fortunately, we won't have to talk about Armageddon for a very yeah, long time. True. I'm really surprised it's on the list, and we'll have to figure out why. But um, not next week. I'm looking forward, I guess, no, to seeing it with a new, new lens, but not next time. Armageddon is a long what, way what off. Next, next time is A Night to Remember by Roy Ward Baker. It is about the Titanic, uh, but takes place in... Well, it was made in 1958. Obviously, it takes place in 1912. It's made in 1958, so it's uh, before we had much of the research we had on the Titanic. That I made. hope the Titanic um, turns out to be a spaceship. I don't think it'll be quite quite that different. Really, I don't think anyone believed the Titanic was a spaceship. We nothing about the Titanic. So this is our best <laughs> guess, and it's like a Nazi spaceship or something. It'd there awesome. we go. It'll be Nazis in space. Space baby Nazis. That's what <laughs> right. it'll be. That's beautiful. Uh, anyway, we'll, we'll see you next time for a night to remember. Yeah, see you later. Thanks for listening. Thanks. All right, bye. bye. Thank you.